Thank you. The next item of business is a debate on motion 12248 in the name of Siobhan Brown on Regulation of Legal Services Scotland Bill at Stage 1. I would invite those members who would wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons and I call on Siobhan Brown uh, to speak to and to move the motion up to nine minutes, please, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I welcome this opportunity to open the debate on the general principles of the Regulation of Legal Services Scotland Bill. I'd like to thank the Equalities, Human Rights and Civil Justice Committee, the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee and the Finance and Public Administration Committee for their careful and considered scrutiny of the bill and for all of those that submitted views and gave evidence at stage one. I very much welcome that the League Committee's Stage 1 report, in which the majority agreed with the general principles of the Bill. Presiding Officer, the current legislative framework underpinning the regulation of legal services and complaints handling is complex and it's dated. The, this Bill presents a modern regulatory framework designed to promote competition and innovation while at the same time improving the transparency and public accountability of legal regulation and the legal complaint system and placing the public and consumer interests at its heart. It sets out the regulatory objectives which must be complied with as legal regulators exercise their functions, including consideration of the consumer principles, the better regulation principles, the human rights principles, and it is a highly technical bill which builds on existing legislation from 1980, 1990, 2007 and 2010. The bill proposes a number of significant and positive changes to the legal services regulatory framework in Scotland. And I'd like to take this opportunity to outline the many benefits that the bill will bring. It will streamline the legal complaint system, which many stakeholders have called for, making the process faster and simpler for the consumers and legal practitioners who find themselves involved in it. This includes introducing a new ability to make complaints against unregulated legal service providers, which increases consumer protection. The new regulatory framework will introduce greater transparency and accountability of our legal service regulators to deliver a framework which maintains public trust and ensures that regulators are operating their regulatory functions independently of any other function. I, sorry to interrupt, Minister. Could you possibly move your microphone? Apologies, Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. There will be a power for the first time to review a regulator's performance and ensure their compliance with their statutory duties and the regulatory ob objectives. Regulators will require to submit annual reports on their performance as Category 1 regulators. Yes? Liam Kerr. Uh, well, uh, just to be up front for the rest of the afternoon, I declare an interest as a practising solicitor and I am regulated by the Law Society of Scotland. Um, this bill is drafted to introduce new powers for Scottish ministers to intervene directly in the regulation of legal services. Now, clearly, the minister thought that such powers set out within Section 19 were needed. Can she give me an example of any time previously when the government would have used these powers had they had them? Minister. Thank you. I, I will come, come to that further down in my speech, if I may, Mr Kerr. Regulators will also be required to create a register of all its members, which is free and accessible to the public, enabling consumers to access useful information about legal service providers. 94% of respondents to our consultation on the bill agreed that it was important that the regulatory framework enables access to justice, including choice and diversity. The bill includes proposals to increase access to justice by removing restrictions on third sector organisations from directly employing solicitors to support their clients in court proceedings. Now, Scot Scottish Women Aid have welcomed this measure, advising that, and I do quote, it will assist in securing dedicated and an innovative provision of domestic abuse, competent legal services for women, children and young people experiencing domestic abuse. Through the bill, we are introducing regulation of legal businesses, which will provide greater powers of oversight for regulators and provide additional protections and consistency for consumers. In addition, the bill will ease ownership requirements for alternative business structures, allowing innovations such as community ownership of legal businesses, which will benefit the legal sector in terms of attracting investment and in succession planning. 
These measures are intended to support and promote sustainable legal services which benefit citizens, principals, which 93% of respondents to our consultation supported. It also protects members of the public against wrongful use of the title of lawyer by those who seek to deceive consumers and imply that they are fully regulated with the protection that that affords. The bill expands the remit of the statutory consumer panel, giving it a role in undertaking research to provide quality, evidence-based advice to the sector in order to ensure decisions are shaped around the needs of the different consumers of legal services. Presiding officer, I acknowledge that this bill has attracted differing, differing views from stakeholders, as did the consultation ahead of the bill. And it was with these differing views that we've had to strike a balance as we aim to modernise the regulatory system. Following... Yes. John Spinney. I, I'm grateful to the Minister for giving way, and I understand the different and competing views that are expressed about the government's proposals. But can I just convey to the Minister a word of advice from somebody who's been around this Parliament a long time, that every time there is an attempt to try to reform regulation of the legal profession, it is vigorously resisted by the legal profession and the Minister should retain her resolve in taking forward the steps that she's taking forward. Minister. I thank the Member for, for his intervention. Um, following the introduction of the Bill and having carefully considered the responses to the Committee's calls for views, I acknowledge the concerns that were raised in respect to the role that was placed on Scottish Ministers and have committed to address this at stage two. These provisions are only one part of the bill and are based on existing legislation. Nonetheless, I sought to address these concerns and my officials have been working closely and collaboratively with stakeholders and in particular, the Lord President's Office and the Law Society of Scotland. Yes. Megan Gallagher. Minister for giving way. The bill itself was uh, linked to the Esther Roberton report but it appears that the government has not accepted the recommendations of that report and it doesn't look as though this bill has united anybody, whether that be the, the consumers or indeed the legal profession. So can I ask the Minister how she feels that they can progress to stage two when we're not even completed or in a position at stage one? Minister. Yes, as I've said previously, there, there were polarised views from, this is going back to 2015, and from the consultation that the Scottish Government did do. You'll note from the briefings that were all sent to MSPs in the past few days regarding this stage one, we've got the Scottish Legal Complaints Commission, Citizen Advice Scotland, Consumers Scotland, CMA and the Law Society of Scotland, and they all welcome stage one and urge the parliament to agree the general principles of the bill. So I think there is collaborative agreement in aspects of the bill moving forward. Following the introduction of the bill and having carefully considered the responses to the committee's views, apologies, I've said that paragraph. These provisions are only one part of the bill and are based on existing legislation. Nonetheless, I, see, I see, sought to address those concerns and my officials have been working closely and collaboratively with stakeholders, including Lord President's Office and the Law Society of Scotland. Presiding officer, the bill has received much support during stage one, and I'd like to note some of these for the chamber today. Consumers Scotland welcome that the bill will require legal regulators to exercise their regulatory functions in a manner compatible with consumer principles. I was also pleased to read the Law Society's comments to the Equalities Committee, which stated, and I quote, the bill contains many important reforms. The committee has also heard broad support for proposals in the bill which reform the legal complaint system and Rosemary Agnew from the Scottish Public Service Ombudsman said that the measures in the bill and I, uh, they enable, and I quote, the development of best practice. Presiding officer, as I said in developing this bill, the Scottish Government sought to ensure that it strikes the right balance between the various interests of stakeholders. The committee's stage one report has recognised that and raised a number of important points. <clears throat> and I have addressed these in my writ response and will continue to update the committee after further consideration of the recommendations ahead of stage two. <coughs> Pardon me. Presiding officer, this bill will provide a modern, forward-looking regulatory framework for Scotland with the best promote competition, innovation and public consumer interest in an efficient, effective and independent I think the minister is probably bringing her remarks to the consumer public interest at heart. Presiding officer, 
I move that the Parliament agrees to the general principles of the regulation of Legal Services Scotland Bill. Thank you, Minister. I now call on Karen Adam to speak on behalf of the Equalities, Human Rights and Civil Justice Committee. Ms Adam. Thank you, President Officer. Before I begin, I'd like to thank Kokab Stewart for her time as convener and congratulate her on her new role. I want to thank all those who provided evidence to the committee. We are grateful for all the views that were expressed to us by representatives of consumer groups and the legal sector, including the senior judiciary. I also want to thank the Clarks, Spice and the wider team who supported us through a stage one scrutiny of the bill and our report. Reform of the regulation of the legal profession in Scotland has long been called for. Whilst not perfect, the bill seeks to introduce a modern set of regulatory objectives and professional principles, incorporating key aspects of the better regulation principles and consumer principles. There was much discussion about the approach being taken to build on the existing regulatory framework rather than introducing an independent regulator, as was proposed in the Robertson report. As we note in our report, there is a sense that the framework proposed does not satisfy consumer groups or the legal profession, but our role is to scrutinise the bill that is before us, so I will cover areas that are included in the bill. Anyone who has been closely following our scrutiny of the bill will be aware that concern has been expressed from the Law Society, Faculty of Advocates and from the senior judiciary that some of the delegated powers proposed in the bill will have a significant detrimental impact on the independence of the judicial system. The Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee reported that it had found it challenging to meaningfully report on a number of delegated powers in the bill. Its report reflected much of what we heard in evidence. And while the Minister indicated that the Scottish Government is engaging with the Lord President and others to bring forward amendments at stage two to address the concerns, when it came to considering the general principles, it was unclear how different the bill might look subject to those amendments. On balance, however, and in light of the reassurance offered by the Minister, we were content by a majority to agree the general principles. We welcome the Scottish Government's prompt response to our Stage 1 report. We note that response contains a summary of its position to the DPLR Committee's recommendations. However, should the Parliament agree to the general principles of the Bill, we are likely to require an extended deadline at Stage 2 to be confident that the amendments are sufficient to allay concerns expressed. Turning yes, absolutely. Liam Kerr. Uh, I'm, I'm very grateful. I'm listening carefully to what's been said. The, Law Society has also said that many of the powers that it had requested from these reforms had actually been left out. Uh, does the committee know why those were left out in the initial drafting of the bill and whether they'll be included at stage two? Karen Adam. Well, we, absolutely, there is a lot of detail in this bill. It's a very technical, detailed bill. The committee did its job by scrutinising what was before us at that time, and it is not for us to say what will be presented at stage two. So turning to other parts of the bill, there was a view across witnesses that the current complaint system is slow and overly complex. The bill seeks to simplify the complaints process, but the creation of two categories of regulators with different regimes maybe means a lot of complexity will remain. We recognise that it will be for the Scottish Legal Complaints Commission to establish its own rules as to how complaints are analysed to determine whether they relate to conduct issues, service issues or both. This highlights the importance of annual reporting to help understand whether or not the operational mechanisms are robust. The bill proposed renaming the Scottish Legal Complaints Commission to the Scottish Legal Services Commission. We welcome the fact that the Scottish Government has listened to the concerns expressed about how this might cause unnecessary confusion and has indicated it will amend the bill at stage two to retain the SLCC's current name. We heard broad support for proposals to update the rules on alternative business structures designed to increase the number of businesses and other bodies to operate as such, as well as to encourage innovation. There were some queries as to how the 10% figure for ownership threshold was reached and the committee was not quite convinced by the rationale provided by the Minister. The government's indication that it will bring forward amendments to remove the ownership requirement and that it will liaise with the Law Society to develop a greater risk-based and proportionate system to the fitness test is therefore welcome. 
We heard conflicting views on the proposal to change the route of appeal in relation to service complaints from the Court of Session to an internal review committee of the SLCC. The Law Society and Faculty of Advocates considered that the right to appeal to court should be automatic, whereas the SLCC supported the introduction of an internal review committee. On balance, we are content that the proposed internal review committee process should provide a more proportionate approach and resolution which will benefit consumers and those who are subject of a complaint. The committee agreed that there is a perception that the term lawyer is interchangeable with the term solicitor. It is important that consumers are absolutely clear about what service they are being offered and by whom. We therefore support the proposal in the bill to regulate the term lawyer. NTT regulation to regulate legal businesses as well as individual solicitors received broad support. The committee welcomes the potential benefits this will bring both for regulators and consumers as part of a modern regulatory framework. Concerns were raised by the Law Society about the special rule exemptions and we welcome the fact that the government is engaging with the Law Society to address these concerns. Presiding officer, this is a very technical bill with a lot of detail to be considered. We acknowledge that there are parts and sections of the bill that will need to be amended at stage two. This could have a potential to leave us with a different bill after stage two and moving on to stage three. But there are many aspects which are welcome and help us move towards a more modern and accessible regulatory framework. This is why the majority of the committee oh, agreed. Absolutely, yeah. Briefly, Misha Thompson. I thank her very much for giving way, but does she recognise the commentary that part of the reason why we ended up where we are at the moment is previous attempts to change things resulting in effect in quite the muddle? And does she share my concern that in effect we could end up in the same position at the end of stage three as a multitude of amendments are placed? Uh, Karen Hassel. I think working through the, the different stages of this bill and the committee taking it as the process goes through, I'm quite confident in the committee's ability to work through that. So there are many aspects which are welcome and help us move towards a more modern and accessible regulatory framework. And this is why the majority of the committee did agree to the general principles. Should the Parliament agree to the general principles, we will scrutinise the amendments fully at stage two and may, if we consider it necessary, invite additional evidence before formally commencing stage two proceedings. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Adam. And I now call on Annie Wells uh, on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives. Ms Best. <clears throat> Thank you, Presiding Officer. My party has long supported changes to the regulation of legal services to improve the system. We believe improvements are necessary for victims and ordinary people who can be let down by an often complex, difficult to understand and outdated system. We hope to see simple and effective legislation changes, legislative changes to tidy up the system, smooth and compl complaints process and modernise elements that need changing. However, unfortunately, the bill before us is not the answer. But before we get into the issues that we have with the legislation, let me outline where we can agree. <clears throat> we support many of the changes proposed by the Bill. We agree with the new rules to increase transparency. We are behind updating the rules on business structures and we support updating legislation and professional principles. We believe it is right to create an offence to prevent people calling themselves lawyers to deceive the public. On all of those points, we are behind the principle of what the government is trying to achieve, although we still believe some of those changes can be improved with reasonable amendments. But we are disappointed by many of the elements of the Bill. It does not provide many solutions. It leaves too many problems untreated that have already been clear clearly identified, and it fails to overhaul the system for the public. The government seems to have lost its way during the creation of this legislation. It ended up rejecting the central recommendation of the Robertson Review it, it itself commissioned. And my colleague Russell Finley will go into this in a wee bit more detail in his contribution. And it left many parts of the legislation to the very last minute. It has provoked a lot of valid criticism from the judiciary and legal experts. The original stated aims for the bill have not been achieved. And firstly, the lack of progress on improvements to the complaints process is a huge missed opportunity. 
This bill is not ambitious enough at tackling the issues in the complaints process, which we should have been one of the top priorities in this legislation. This bill doesn't seem to make it much faster. It doesn't appear to make it much easier for ordinary people. It doesn't give much extra help or support to victims of crime and people who have been failed by the justice system. And on this point, there seems to be concerns across the Parliament, including in the SNP. Michelle Thompson, MSP, recently asked in this chamber if the bill will meet the original objectives of the Roberton Review regarding consumer complaints. And she also made the point that there is a clear and fundamental conflict of interest in having consumer complaints processed by bodies that exist to protect the interests of the profession. And ministers have not yet done enough to address these concerns. And moving on to other issues that we have with this bill, we share the concerns of the senators of the College of Justice, Law Society of Scotland, Faculty of Advocates and International Bar Association about the proposed new powers for Scottish Government ministers. Those powers are ripe for political abuse. And they could be misused by politicians of any party in government. The prospect of any government having a lot of power to interfere in the judicial process is troubling. And this looks like a power grab that could have worrying consequences for free and fair justice in Scotland. This bill goes too far and risks the independence of the ju judiciary, which must be protected. In summary, presiding officer, this bill sought to strike a balance between retaining elements of the current system and overhauling it completely. The government haven't got that balance right. Instead of real progress, we have a bill that nobody really wants. It has barely been welcomed by anyone. In short, our objection to this bill are that it goes too far on powers for SNP ministers and not far enough on powers for the public. On powers for the SNP government, it leaves too many grey areas where ministers could choose to intervene, and it opens the door for political abuse. Yeah, of course not. Minister. I thank the member for taking an intervention. Would the member recognise, and I think I've written to the committee about this, that I have recognised the, the ministerial powers and I am engaging to remove them from the bill? Annie Wells. Yeah, and I thank the Minister for that intervention, and I do recognise that, but at the moment we haven't seen them and we don't know if they're actually going to do the right thing to, to get the bill into the place it should be. Um, but on powers to victims and the public, my party believes this legislation falls short of what was anticipated regarding the complaints process. It doesn't achieve the government's original ambitions, and it barely changes the system for the better. It does not deliver faster and easier process for victims and the public. So for those reasons, we cannot... I'm actually just coming to a conclusion here, sorry. For those reasons, we cannot get behind this bill at this stage. We hope it can be improved by amendments at later stages, but the flaws are substantial and the missed opportunities are vast. It will take a lot to improve this bill. Thank you, presiding officer. Thank you, Ms. Wells. I now call on Paul O'Kane on behalf of Scottish Labour. Mr. O'Kane. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I'm pleased to be opening for uh, Scottish Labour in this debate. And I think we would want to recognise the importance of the bill, the debate, uh, and the issues contained therein. And I think we've already, in the, the contributions so far, started to see, I think, the emerging issues uh, that have been debated by committee, and I think will be a feature of this bill as it continues its progress. Um, I think I would want to try and start, if I can, from a position of where there, there is some consensus. I do think there are things within the bill that are uh, to be welcomed and encouraged in terms of the improvement uh, for legal services and the delivery of legal services in Scotland. Um, I think it is clear from all of the evidence that was heard on the bill uh, in committee um, that many feel that the complaint system, as it currently exists, uh, is in need of reform and isn't fit for purpose, and there is work, certainly, to be done uh, in that regard. I think it's also clear that there is support uh, for reforms around regulating legal businesses and providing more protections uh, to safeguard uh, consumers, indeed the public, um, uh, and to ensure that um, access to justice is, is, more e is easier. Uh, for people and, and is done in the kind of full knowledge that there will be um, a, a right of recourse um, where there are uh, issues indeed. Um, I think as we've heard already in the debate, there are clearly areas that need further development. 
Um, and of course, I think everyone would want to engage fully in this process to ensure that at stage two and indeed stage three, we are uh, looking in great detail about where changes can come to the bill uh, to make it better. It is clear to me in saying all of that, that there is work to be done at quite a fundamental level in this bill, um, specifically around the current drafting, uh, which grants significant power to ministers. Um, that would compromise or could compromise the independence of the judiciary and uh, the judicial system. Um, I think I will certainly give way. Yeah. Michel I, Thompson. I thank him for giving away. On that point, obviously, I am well aware of the stushy around that, but I am sure I recall Esther Roberton herself saying that it would be relatively uh, easy for a role to still be maintained for the Lord President and therefore forgoing that. Is that his recollection from all the evidence sessions? In other words, it is not impossible with goodwill on all sides. Paul O'Kane. I think we heard a, a, a variety. We heard, did hear a variety of evidence uh, on either side of that, and I, I do recognise what the member is saying. I think, however, what was clear to me is the significant concerns that were raised by the, not just the judiciary but the faculty of advocates, uh, the law society, and many other of those bodies within the legal profession. And I, I do have a, a significant concern about the wider piece about the independence of the judiciary and ensuring that that is uh, protected. And I think that's what we heard quite clearly uh, in our consideration uh, of um, the evidence that was brought forward. And it was part of the reason why I, I advocated that the committee didn't take a position on stage one uh, of the bill and didn't recommend whether to uh, support the bill or not. Because I, I just don't think we've had enough clarity in terms of what amendments might be brought um, by the government. Uh, in terms of this point. Um, and I, I did ask the government, because I don't think it is uh, unheard of to bring amendments forward in draft form so that they can be considered in, in more detail. And I thought the point the convener made about the requirement for further scrutiny is going to be important, because if the government is to bring substantive amendments that will change the, the, the core of the bill in this regard, there's going to have to be a level of scrutiny uh, of those, and people will have to give evidence and give their view on either side of that debate. So I do think it would have been helpful had we been able to... The government has given a commitment in writing to the committee, has made that commitment uh, when the minister came to give evidence. But it's clear to me that we could have been further along if we'd been able to discuss those amendments in, in draft form uh, before we got to this stage one debate. I'll take Liam Kerr. Liam Kerr. I, I'm very grateful. I, I'm really enjoying listening to the member's contribution and, and think he makes very important points. Did the minister give the committee any indication as to when those draft amendments might be proposed so that we can scrutinise them? Paul O'Kane. Well, I think it, Mr Kerr's point is, is one that I think came up in the committee. I think timescales were given that it would happen um, within the course of um, stage two. I don't think we had any further clarity at that point, and I was concerned by that. I do take that the Minister has said clearly that she will bring these amendments and that she is in dialogue with the Lord President on a variety, just in a moment, I'll just finish this point, on a, the variety of issues. But for me, it was just that lack of certainty. I don't doubt the Minister's intent, but I would like to see what the detail of those are, and I'll give way to the Minister on that point. Minister. I thank the Member um, for taking the intervention. Does the, the member acknowledge that I have been advised that it would be inappropriate to share the amendments ahead of stage two, but would the member agree that I've, I have committed as, at stage two I will be sharing the amendments with the committee? Paula King. Uh, I mean, I, I absolutely accept the minister in terms of what she's saying, but she has made that commitment. I don't think, it, don't think it's unheard of to have amendments shared ahead of a stage two process. Indeed, in, in consultations in this parliament on pieces of legislation, there are draft clauses that have been shared ahead of the drafting of a bill. So, um, you, you know, I think, I think it is possible to do that, and particularly in terms of trying to build the consensus we, we would seek to have. Um, I think that the government has recognised um, the challenge in trying to bring people together on this and that um, the bill has not commanded a huge degree of enthusiasm from all sides, that there are significant challenges from the side of those who want to see uh, stronger representation for consumers and indeed those who want to ensure that we protect um, the profession and the independence of that as well. Um, it remains my view, as it was in committee, that we do need to ensure that we try and build as much consensus as we, ha we can, and that there will have to be opportunities within the stage two process, if the bill passes stage one this afternoon, which I imagine it will, given the support uh, the government has for it. We have to ensure that that process is, is robust, 
allows amendments to be brought forward, allows there to be sufficient evidence uh, brought and given to committee on those uh, to ensure that we can try and move forward with the best bill possible. Now, I'm very conscious of time, presiding officer, and I'll have an opportunity to sum up, but I think I will leave my remarks there. Uh, we look forward to the rest of this debate and to ensuring that those points and that assurance by the Minister can be given once again in this chamber so that it's on the record. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Kane. And I now call on Liam MacArthur on behalf of the Scottish Liberal Democrats. Mr MacArthur. Thank you very much, uh, President Officer. Can I start by uh, thanking the Equality, Human Rights and Civil Justice Committee for their work. Welcome Karen Adam to her new role uh, and congratulate her predecessor, Cocab Stewart, on her uh, promotion to ministerial office. Um, I think the report itself is, is considered. Um, it's not been an easy task, particularly where there are um, divisions within the committee. As a former member of the Justice Committee, uh, who was on that committee at the time the Roberton Review uh, was uh, published, uh, at that time I met representatives of the legal profession of consumer groups and indeed Esther Roberton herself. So it comes uh, as no surprise to me that views remain uh, polarised, that any decision, any compromise was likely to prove unpopular on both sides. I think I would disagree probably with Megan Gallagher um, that uh, unity has, uh, hasn't been achieved, because I think it has in relation to the unpopularity uh, of the inevitably, needlessly and I think quite rightly um, uh, expressed outrage across the board to the ministerial overreach. And I think that issue has come to dominate uh, a lot of consideration of a bill that has uh, many other aspects to it. And I'll come back to that issue shortly. But I think it's worth reminding ourselves that, that reform is indeed over, uh, uh, long overdue. The current framework uh, for legal services complaints is outdated, confusing and doesn't meet uh, the needs of either the public or indeed the profession itself. I think for members of the public, the complexity uh, makes it difficult for the public to engage. It creates doubt, suspicion and as a result, I think a reluctance often uh, to submit a complaint. And then for practitioners, I think the delays also affect uh, confidence. They can cause frustration. I think there's even um, the potential uh, for reputational risk as well as the impact on other work they may be undertaking. So the case for reform, I think, is compelling and the bill is therefore uh, desperately needed. Um, I think it's true to say also that there are many welcome measures uh, in this and those have been recognised, I think, across the board. A more streamlined, uh, flexible, less legalistic uh, process is undoubtedly in uh, the interests of everybody uh, concerned. The checks and balances to protect consumers and promote transparency, again, very welcome. Uh, more robust requirements around um, the use of the term lawyer, which, uh, again, I think has probably come as a surprise to many, but um, certainly needs uh, addressed. On these areas, I think still greater clarity, more detail uh, will be needed, but they are at least in the bill. I think Liam Kerr, though, was right to point to concerns that have been raised by the Law Society and others about the absence of certain provisions that were expected to be in this bill. And I think that goes to the, the, uh, the nub of the problem we're now seeing, that in its rush to introduce the legislation, I think the government have found themselves in a mess of their own making with a bill that really wasn't ready to be introduced. The burden now does fall on, largely on the committee at stage two, though the risk is there at stage three, as I think Michelle Thompson rightly said. It's not impossible to resolve, but it puts a lot of pressure uh, on the committee and, the, and subsequently at stage three. I don't hold the minister responsible for this. Clearly, this is a bill she has inherited, and I think some of the undertakings she has made to try and address those concerns uh, are very welcome. But that ministerial overreach, the, the, the unprecedented powers to regulate legal services do um, have alar alarm bells ringing. It is not often, um, despite what Mr Swinney um, uh, suggested earlier, that you see the Lord Justice Clark um, intervening in a debate to suggest that, um, in a sense, the rule of law is under uh, attack. I'll, yes, I'll give way to Mr. Sure. John Sweeney. I, 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 I take very seriously the point that Mr. MacArthur makes and the comments that the Lord Justice Clark has put on the record, and indeed the Lord President has said, and I'll come on to say something about this if the presiding officer calls me to speak in the debate. But there also has to be a responsibility on the leaders of the judiciary and the legal system to accept that if there is public dissatisfaction about the system over which they are presiding, that they have got to themselves act to resolve some of these questions into the bargain. Liam MacArthur. Mr Sweeney for that intervention, and I wouldn't disagree with it um, I, I, at all. I think Michelle Thompson actually herself um, said that there needs to be uh, goodwill on, on all sides in, in reaching a compromise, but we are not where we should be at the end of the stage one process. I think that is uh, fairly clear 
to see. Um, I, I think the lack of consultation on that specific proposal is all the more surprising given that this is a process that has been ongoing for um, the best part of a, of a decade. Now, the commitment, as I say, from the Minister to bring forward amendments uh, at stage two is very welcome. We haven't yet seen the detail, as Paul Kane uh, pointed out. I think there is precedent here. I well remember um, the now First Minister uh, undertaking uh, to bring forward uh, to the Justice Committee uh, future amendments in relation to the hate crime bill in, uh, around uh, intent. So it's not wholly unprecedented. But I think Parliament is now engaged in, in a high wire act. I think uh, as things stand, Scottish Liberal Democrats could not support this bill at stage three. Um, it would vote against the bill at stage three and, and will find it difficult to support the bill now. It will, though, as Paula came, I think, acknowledged uh, passed this evening. And I would um, certainly commit to work with the Minister and others to ensure that this bill, this um, much needed bill, does actually provide the, the, the proportionate and effective um, protections and improvements that support both uh, the public but also those within the legal profession. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr MacArthur. Uh, we will now move to the open debate. I would advise members that at this point there is some time in hand for intervention, should members so wish. And with that, I call John Swinney to be followed by Russell Finlay. Mr Swinney. President Officer, on the 2nd of May 1997, the day after my election as the member of the United Kingdom Parliament for North Tayside, my campaign office took my first call from a constituent who sought an urgent meeting with me as his newly elected member of parliament. My constituent had been working for some years with my predecessor, the Conservative MP Bill Walker, to resolve difficulties he had experienced with the legal profession. My involvement with that case lasted for more than a decade. During that time, I observed my constituent assiduously and tenaciously pursue his concerns with my active support, but in a way that consumed, literally consumed, a huge part of my constituent's life. That case, and others like it with which I have dealt, led me to take an active part in the proceedings of the Legal Profession and Legal Aid Scotland Bill that passed in this Parliament in December 2006. That 2006 Bill was designed to improve the system for regulating the legal profession and making it easier for complaints about poor conduct and service to be effectively handled. We now find ourselves 18 years later having to revisit these issues because significant concerns remain about the conduct of some elements of the legal profession and a lack of confidence that the current arrangements adequately protect the consumer interest. And that is not where the historic comparisons end. In the 2006 Bill proceedings, it was clear that the legal profession pushed back against some of the reforms. And that is exactly what Parliament faces in the consideration of this Bill today. I believe the Scottish Government is absolutely correct and absolutely justified to confront these issues and to bring forward reforms to the way this system operates. Now, many strong words have been used to express opposition to this bill, and we've heard some of them today. The most significant of those accusations is that the bill is a threat to the independence of the legal profession. Now, I have no desire to see the independence of the judiciary or the legal profession compromised in any way. And I believe the Minister has given assurances that concerns of that type will be adequately addressed in the further stages of the bill. But concern over that point cannot be used as a, as, as a reason for refusing to proceed with the reform agenda. Uh, of course. Michelle Thompson. I thank you very much for, for uh, giving way. And I already know in this debate thus far, with the exception of, of uh, Mr Swinney, that all the airtime seems to have been given to complaints of the Law Society rather than recognising the real voice of the consumers. Would he agree? I, 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 I couldn't agree more with my colleague Michelle Thompson because it's the voice of the consumer that I'm concerned about in all of this and it was the voice of the consumer I was concerned about in 2006 when I sought some of the reforms and changes that would have strengthened the process in 2006, which unfortunately I was unsuccessful on that occasion. I may be more successful on this occasion to address those issues of the consumer interest that Michelle Thompson correctly puts to me. Um, I, will, uh, I will give way to Mr. Carter. Uh, Lee MacArthur. 
thank um, Mr Swinney for reciprocating the, the, the intervention. I, I think it's absolutely right that consumer interests need to be taken on board, but is there not a danger in not recognising the concerns of the legal profession that one puts undue weight on one side and actually reaching the, the, the compromised position that uh, Michelle Thompson referred to earlier becomes more difficult as a result? John Swinney. In, 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 a, in a sense, I'm going to burst into violent agreement with Mr MacArthur today. It's not, it's not particularly new that Mr MacArthur and I agree on many things, but it is a sensitive balance, but the point I'm making in my speech, if I can perhaps cut to the chase, is there are some of us in here who are not going to allow the consumer voice to be emasculated as it has been in the past. We're not going to allow that to happen. I'm not going to raise specific cases of poor conduct. A number have been well rehearsed in the public domain. We all know who they involve. But what is clear is the current arrangements have not adequately addressed those cases. In their submission to the Scottish Government consultation, the Centres of the College of Justice say, at present the legal profession is regulated by the Lord President. He is a regulator who is independent from government and parliament and independent from those whom he regulates. I accept that is the case. But what flows from that statement is that the Lord President has to understand and address the fact that a number of us deal with members of the public who are fundamentally dissatisfied with the effectiveness of the arrangements over which he presides. The Government has brought forward a bill to address the concerns of the consumers of legal services, our constituents, those we represent. Those reforms are unpopular with some parts of the legal profession. The Government has indicated it will bring forward amendments after dialogue with the Lord President. Parliament is yet to see those amendments, although we have seen a letter from the Minister which sets out the territory in which they will be set out. So that rather sums up the uncomfortable spot to which Parliament finds itself today. In trying to construct agreement with the Lord President about how to reform the regulation of the legal profession whilst maintaining its independence, I encourage the Government to hold fast to the necessity of delivering measures that will effectively address genuine and legitimate concerns that previous reforms have failed to do. Many of us will be engaging in this debate to make sure reforms that do exactly that are delivered. Thank you, Mr Finley. I now call Russell Finlay to be followed by Michelle Thompson. Mr Finlay. Uh, th thank you, President Officer. Um, in my old life, members of the public would turn up at the front desk of my newspaper office and ask to speak with a journalist, and you never knew what you would get. Sometimes it would be a front-page story. Uh, more often than not, it would be a poor soul in need of help. Uh, many had experienced uh, problems at the hands of lawyers, just as John Swinney described folders stuffed with carefully indexed documents, desperate for help and nowhere left to turn. And as a journalist, once you write about one particular subject, it generates much more of the same. And I ended up investigating the antics of lawyers across Scotland. Some were utterly incompetent, some were completely criminal. Others uh, managed to be both useless and crooked. And to the broken clients, the impact was often life-changing. And it usually came at a devastating financial cost. Attempts to negotiate Scotland's Byzantine and bewildering complaints process was daunting. And to understand what I mean, this is page eight of Esther Robertson's Fit for the Future report showing the regulatory system. And uh, this is a map of the Tokyo subway stations, which frankly is easier to follow. Uh, simple injustices which should have resulted in a quick and easy fix became bogged down in a quagmire of endless process tainted by bad faith. Lawyers who committed fraud were not always treated in the same way as everyday criminals. Instead of being put in the dock, they were subject to glacially slow and painfully weak regulatory action controlled by their lawyer colleagues. Far too often, the crooked and useless got away with devastating people's lives. Put simply, there was no meaningful redress, or it was too little, too late. Lawyers were protected by a system that should have protected the public. There is little more corrosive than suffering and injustice. It is even worse when that injustice is caused by the justice system. Victims felt hopeless, and I felt helpless on their behalf. I became passionate and also puzzled about this regulatory scandal. How could it be allowed 
to destroy, how could they be allowed to destroy lives and effectively get away with it? And also, why would the vast majority of decent and diligent lawyers tolerate the protection of rotten practitioners? Fundamental to this is the role played by the Law Society of Scotland. Their primary function is to represent the interests of their 13,000 solicitor members across Scotland, and they're very good at it. But they have another role, and that is to regulate the misconduct of their own members. This is a glaring conflict of interest, no matter how it is spun. Is there time? Uh, I can give a brief amount of time back. Michelle Thompson. Thank you very much, and I'll be very brief. Uh, having gone through all the evidence sessions, I was surprised that nobody in the committee asked the Law Society how much revenue and what that was as a percentage of the overall revenue was embedded in their role as regulators. Does he think that might have been significant? Russell Finlay. Yeah, it's an, in it's an interesting point um, and one that, not being a member of the committee, I didn't have an opportunity to explore, but thank you. Um, now, the Robertson Review, which was, of course, commissioned by none other than the Deputy Presiding Officer for the SNP um, government. Mr. Finley, could you please yeah. you say, just we say, I, I, as a matter of fact, that is, of course, a matter of fact, but I am actually here as the Presiding Officer in the Chair, and that is my role here today. Thank you. Sure. No, I don't, I don't say that as any form of criticism or anything of that nature, just a matter of fact that you were the Minister at the time responsible for um, ordering the review. Um, and Esther Robertson found the system to be not fit for purpose. She made 40 recommendations, with the main one of these being to create a single regulator for all providers of legal services in Scotland. This, she said, should be independent of both government and those it regulates. Now, that was more than five years ago. But the SNP government rejected her key recommendation. Somehow, they've managed to make it, the situation even worse by seeking to exert inappropriate ministerial power over legal regulation. If I have time. Briefly, Minister. Thank you. Would the member acknowledge that ministers have had a role in legal regulation in Scotland since 1990? In 2007 and in 2010, Parliament placed further functions on Scottish ministers in respect of legal services regulation. Having said that, I understand the concerns that have been raised and I will be bringing forward amendments, but there have been ministerial powers previously. Sure, I appreciate there have been historic uh, ministerial powers, but I think what's been proposed goes well beyond that, and I look forward to hearing what the suggested amendments will be. Um, Esther Roberts' evidence, recent evidence to Parliament was absolutely scathing. And she said, and I can quote here directly, there is no compromise, either you believe in independent regulation, as I do, or you do not. And she went on to say that the SNP's bill makes the process, this process, um, much more complex. I mean, how could it get any more complex than this? It seems to have been a massive waste of time, a missed opportunity, and frankly, a disservice to the people of Scotland. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Finlay. I now call Michelle Thompson to be followed by Casey Clark. Ms Thompson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Now, today I intend to speak on just one element of the bill, the process of complaints. Probably I'm the only member here who's been through the entire process, taking over six years after submitting a complaint about a solicitor some years back. I've had dealings with all the bodies involved, the Scottish Legal Complaints Commission, the Law Society of Scotland and the Scottish Solicitors Disciplinary Tribunal. Now, I regard myself as someone who's pretty resilient, yet I found the process to be extraordinarily complex, opaque, time-consuming, traumatic and lacking in justice. It takes no account of the impact on the complainant and is frankly biased in favour of the solicitor and the legal profession. At the outside, outset, I asked about the process. Little further detail was given, but it was made clear as part of the response from which I quote, we normally take the solicitor's word at face value. I was told to gather evidence, but no advice was given us what, to, what was meant by evidence. I had recruited a KC, now a judge, yet his evidence on my behalf was given scant attention when compared to the solicitor about whom I had complained. 
The Law Society gave no consideration of the re-traumatisation I suffered as a result of their process, despite my making them aware. My confidence in the committee to whom case decisions go for final sign-off was fatally compromised when a lay member told me, we don't have time to read all the casework. We simply sign off on what the investigator says. Now, I don't intend to give more detail today, but I thank the Minister for meeting me and Ash Reagan when she was previously in post. And I will undertake to speak individually with any MSP, member of the Equalities Committee and indeed the Minister again. I also extend that invitation to the Lord President. He is merely accountable but not responsible for what goes on under his watch. I feel sure he would be shocked by the details that I can articulate. John Swinney. I'm, 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 interested, I'm grateful to Michelle Thompson for giving me, and I'm interested in her point about the accountability of the Lord President, because I, I actually believe there has to be some degree of accountability here, but I'm, I'm unclear as to what that accountability mechanism is. I wonder if Michelle Thompson can enlighten me uh, about what that, uh, that, that is in the current environment. Uh, Michelle Thompson. I, I must admit, I'm not entirely sure. I mean, we understand that the meaning of the term accountability and how that's differentiated from responsibility. But I would ask the Lord President what active interest he takes in the multitude of situations I think we've all had as MSPs and indeed the situation I'm articulating here. But, presiding officer, it's not really about the process. This is about power and the lack of independence giving undue power to the legal profession and far too little to our fellow citizens with genuine complaints. Like most people, I'm not trained in the process of weighting evidence or being able to assess the bar for beyond reasonable doubt required for the SSDT or on the balance of probabilities for the SLCC. The lawyer about whom I made my complaints held many cards, not least of all because it wasn't the first time he'd been through it. The lawyers who assessed my complaints held all the rest of the cards. Now, I've thought a great deal about the original situation. The only way I could have protected myself from the original solicitor would have been to record every meeting, ask for everything in writing, and to seek independent verification of any claim they made or advice they proffered. The only way I could have protected myself from the complaints process would have been not to bother and go straight to legal action. But I thought I would do the right thing as somebody who holds her society dear, and I thought the legal profession would do the right thing. It's hardly a ringing endorsement what I actually experienced. So this led me to recognise the need for independent regulation. If it's good enough for multiple other professions, such as architects, dentists, doctors, teachers, why isn't it good enough for the legal profession? Other countries recognise its benefits. Why not Scotland? Why should our consumers be expected to settle for second best? Presiding officer, I believe the proposed legislation, despite recognising the efforts of the minister, and I know we've discussed this, is inadequate. And I agree with the comments of Professor Stephen Mason, who notes, the government has boxed itself into a corner. It said that we cannot have independent regulation and can no longer sustain self-regulation. We have to fudge something in whatever the mix is, and I'm afraid that the fudge will not work. Given that the principles in the bill don't place our citizens at the heart of the complaints process, I urge the Minister to be bold, but I should inform the Chamber that on today, for the reasons I've set out, I shall abstain. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms Thompson. I now call Katie Clark to be followed by Fulton McGregor. Ms Clark. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I would want to put on record and make a declaration that I am a former member of the Law Society of Scotland and indeed a former member of the Law Society of England and Wales and have worked as a solicitor in both jurisdictions in the past. Um, however, I agree with much that's been said in this chamber today and I believe there is a widespread consensus in society that reform of legal service 
services are required and that many who use legal services or indeed try to get legal help often have concerns about the quality of the service they receive, the transparency of the feeing process and the inability to complain in any meaningful way. And whilst, of course, most people that use legal services will no doubt be very pleased with the service they receive and on many occasions will feel that solicitors and indeed advocates offer excellent services at a very reasonable cost or indeed on occasions pro bono, it's when things go wrong um, that we really have to focus today. So I have sympathy with some of the general principles of this bill and I do think it's unfortunate that we still have the ministerial powers on the face of the bill as we're having this discussion today, because I think that has distorted the nature of the debate. In their briefing for MSPs, Citizens Advice Bureau Scotland, um, who provides advice on legal processes to thousands of people every year, give detail of their YouGov public opinion poll they commissioned in late 2022 that found that two-thirds of those who responded would prefer an independent regulator to oversee the legal profession, compared with one in eight who support the status quo. And 74% of the respondents to that survey felt that having an independent regulator would increase public confidence. So, as I say, I think there's widespread support for some of the general principles in this bill. And I hope that once the amendments come forward, we're perhaps able to really focus on some of those challenges. Because, as outlined in the committee report, there are some very strongly held views in relation to whether um, the decision to adopt the principal recommendations of the review for independent regulation was the correct one. And, as I say, I would have hoped that would have been the focus today. I think it's also um, significant that the committee report noted the broad and significant opposition to the initial proposals to give powers to Scottish ministers in certain parts of this bill. I believe that this bill is potentially a great opportunity to strengthen consumer rights, but as it stands, I don't believe that can be the focus, unfortunately. The current complaints process clearly needs urgent and drastic reform, and I believe that the provisions of this bill simply do not go far enough. Scottish Labour concern, con shares the concerns being expressed by the Law Society of Scotland and others about the new powers can take in the bill to intervene directly in the regulation of legal services and we agree with Esther, Esther Robertson who led the independent review into the reform of regulation of legal services in Scotland that government involvement is not in the interests of the government itself, the legal profession or indeed most importantly the public. We believe that the independence of the legal profession from the state lies at the heart of the rule of law and indeed in public trust. Um, I was very interested um, that the Minister is bringing forward amendments. I'm not a member of the committee that scrutinised the bill um, and therefore I'm not clear how substantive those amendments will be. Um, the sections which seem to present a great deal of concern, sections 19, 20, Schedule 2, Section 41, and Section 49 give extensive powers to ministers. And in summing up, I would hope that the Scottish Government is able to give a clearer position as to whether they would be proceeding with those powers um, when we get to the next stages of the bill. Thank you, Ms Clark. I now call Fulton McGregor to be followed by Michael Chapman. Mr McGregor. Thank you, President Officer. Um, reform in this area is overdue, as others have said. Proposals to change the current regulation of legal services began nearly a decade ago when the Law Society of Scotland's Case for Change paper was submitted in 2015. What followed was an independent review of the regulation of legal services in Scotland, which gave 40 recommendations that sought to modernise the current regulatory framework to ensure a proportionate approach, supporting growth and competitive provision in the legal services sector, all whilst placing consumer interests at its heart. Following this, a public consultation of the recommendations was launched and I want to thank all those who engaged and responded to this public consultation. These were invaluable contributions in shaping the early stages of this bill, which will seek to implement a number of the recommendations from the independent review. Also, as a member of the committee, presiding officer, I also want to thank all stakeholders who have given evidence to the committee at stage one, 
Consumer in Scotland in particular were right to point out that those in need of legal services often use them while dealing with challenging and potentially traumatic experiences. And we've heard a wee bit of that in the Chamber today. This can understandably cause stress and confusion for those engaging with the system. The stress and confusion can be compounded by the difficulty in understanding legal terms, jargon and laws, which can be extremely daunting for anyone out with the sector, never mind those <coughs> who have experienced some grim personal circumstances. Consumer Scotland also noted that 48% of adults in Scotland have experienced events in the last two years that indicated they may have need for legal support. This statistic alone underlines the necessity for a modernised and accessible regulatory framework regarding legal services in Scotland. And although, of course, there will be further discussions to come, Citizens Advice Scotland articulated well the current problems when they acknowledged that the current system is too rigid and unsuitable for supporting and engendering a thriving and dynamic legal services landscape, as well as being too complex and difficult, often for the public to understand. And I must also note that stakeholders such as the Senators of the College of Justice Faculties of Advocates Law Society of, and Law Society of Scotland gave evidence to the committee suggesting that the current model of regulation was already effective and independent. During our committee sessions, we stressed the importance of resolving any concerns as efficiently as possible, as any delays could risk undermining the independence and efficacy of Scotland's legal system. On this, I welcome the assurances from the Scottish Government that, although perhaps a bit unorthodox, they will introduce amendments at stage two, which will ensure that these issues can be addressed and that these reforms will not be delayed. And beside Nosser, due to the large body of evidence that we have heard and the assurances and commitment from the Scottish Government to fairly address any concerns, as well as the undeniable need for reform, I believe that the broad provisions of the Bill have strong benefits, which we in the Committee have scrutinised. The majority of the committee voted to give support for these general principles in respect of the improvements that would be made to legal regulation in Scotland. But of course, as we have heard today, that was not without some great difficulty. Some of these areas were the polarisation of views on the independent regulator, with some strong views from those against it. The concerns, as has already been talked about, about initial proposals on the ministerial powers and the fact that the minister has committed to coming forward uh, coming back sorry, uh, sorry, at stage two um, with amendments, which isn't a usual approach, and we did uh, take that into account in our committee report, and the fear that the bill perhaps tries to strike a balance that in the end pleases no one. This was a common theme in our committee evidence sessions, and perhaps even the contributions of colleagues across the chamber today demonstrate that, with some contributors, I think Annie Wells, saying that the proposals went too far, and others, Katie Clark, saying that they didn't go far enough. That, I think that gives, uh, would give a wee indication to members who were perhaps not on the committee of what, what we were faced with on a fairly regular basis on, commi on committee sessions, with, uh, with, with really um, the proposals in the bill not pleasing anybody. So I think it is a tight... I, the member is actually about to conclude, hopefully. Thank okay, you. In, con in conclusion, President Officer, I would urge the Chamber to vote for the general principles of the Bill. There is much work to be done at stage two to get it into a place that, that we want it to be. I know the Minister is committed to that, and uh, I hope that we can pass this today and allow us to move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr McGregor. I now call Maggie Chapman to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Ms Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This Bill has been a long time coming. For over a decade, consumer groups and members of the legal profession have, in various forms, called for reviews, updates or changes to the regulation of legal, of legal services, the associated complaint systems and the mechanisms for ensuring consumers, our citizens, get the kinds of services and support they need. So I am pleased to be able to support the principles of this bill today. That's not to say I'm content with everything as it stands, far from it, but this bill matters for our citizens today. I want to put on record my sincere thanks to all those who contributed to the committee's work over the last six months on this important legislation. The detailed evidence we received and the care and commitment witnesses have shown to what are some pretty technical aspects are very much appreciated. I am grateful too to Esther Robertson for laying the groundwork for this bill and of course to my committee colleagues and our clerks and SPICE team for guiding us through stage one. 
Because there are things in this bill that are very much needed to make things better and fairer for the citizens that we represent. Indeed, Consumer to Scotland told us that reform of the current system is necessary and long overdue. When people engage with the legal services, as Fulton McGregor outlined, they are often going through stressful or difficult situations. They might be vulnerable, experiencing personal tragedy or trauma, or have specific issues relating to illness or disability that require care and compassion. Having to deal with technical, legal language and formal structures can exacerbate the stresses and anxieties they have. It is only right, then, that these citizens have confidence in the legal system they need at times of stress and difficulty. There clearly needs to be strong checks and balances in place, and the system must be transparent, accountable, easy to understand, and subject to appropriate oversight. I look forward to discussions during forthcoming stages to ensure this legislation gets all of this right. I warmly welcome specifically the proposal that regulatory bodies must take into account consumer principles. We know that principles linked to public interest, access to justice, quality and innovation are understood and widely accepted. The need for effective communication across the system is also clear. But the explicit inclusion of the principles of access, choice, equality, safety, representation, fairness, information and redress will, I hope, deliver tangible benefits and, and tangible improvements in consumer outcomes. And of course, we must ensure there is appropriate monitoring and evaluation to provide evidence of these improvements. I welcome the widening of the consumer panel's remit. We all here share the responsibility for ensuring that panel then has the resources that it needs to do its job well. And of course, providing clarity for consumers on what they will get when engaging a lawyer is also very welcome. Others have already highlighted the complexity of the current complaints system, and I don't have time to go into all of that just now, but we must work on further simplification in the coming stages. Finally, presiding officer, much has been discussed this afternoon and elsewhere about the role for ministerial powers and the concerns around genuine independence of the judiciary. I look forward to working with colleagues in subsequent stages on the amendments that the Minister has promised, and I remain keen to ensure we achieve effective and appropriate oversight of the overseer, as committee colleagues will know. I am heartened by Marsha Scott's recognition that this bill is, and I quote, an opportunity to pivot the system away from the imbalances of power and privilege inimicable to human rights for women and children. So in closing, presiding officer, there is much for us to do at stage two, including addressing some of the things not currently included in the bill. I look forward to working with our new committee convener and others on this important work over the coming months. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Chapman. I now call Stuart McMillan to be followed by Jeremy Balfour. Ms McMillan. Uh, thank you very much, Representing Officer. Representing Officer, I'm speaking today not as the Chair of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, but uh, certainly as a backbench uh, MSP. I am delighted to be speaking in the debate, and I do want to thank colleagues from the Equality, Human Rights and Civil Justice Committee for their helpful report. I think that the Scottish Women's Aid briefing that we all received, I thought, was uh, tremendously helpful uh, in this particular regard. I want to read out two of the bullet points that they highlighted. Uh, the first one is that the current process it fails to recognise the barriers vulnerable people face when engaging the systems where there is a power imbalance. This is very specifically in relation to women experiencing domestic abuse who are reluctant uh, to complain in the first instance. And the second of the points is the professional body's role in, complaining, uh, sorry, in complaint handling carried out in tandem with the role as representative bodies for their respective professions has not instilled confidence in consumers around the independence of the process. Uh, these two particular points, particularly the, the second one, uh, actually are part of the backdrop to uh, my considerations on this bill, and that's uh, with regards to the situation with McClure's solicitors and their collapse in 2021. Uh, and as the Chamber will know, I've uh, highlighted this in the Chamber before. And as I have more members debate, uh, on this uh, issue next to Tuesday, I will be focused on my comments today because I will say more on Tuesday. But ultimately, I have never had a single issue which has taken up so much uh, of my time and also the time of my staff. Over 300 constituents have been in contact with many others from across Scotland and also in England. Uh, they have been in touch with my office and my staff have obviously referred uh, them to contact their own MSP or MP. 
And the two public meetings that are hosted have had over 260 people in attendance. And I want to put on record my thanks to the Scottish Legal Complaints Commission, the SLCC, for supporting both of those events and for having the direct engagements with my constituents. And under the current legal framework that we have, uh, what the SLCC can do is limited. And that was clear by some of the answers that Neil Stevenson, the Chief Executive Officer of the SLCC, had to provide. However, the current bill that we are discussing is an opportunity to actually improve that process. And currently, the SLCC can only be responsive and not proactive. They are also limited in taking on group issues. And this, I appreciate, would always be hugely complicated as every case is different. However, there will undoubtedly be some common issues that, if taken as a group complaint, they could deal with them more complaints in a shorter time frame. And the comments from the SLCC briefing highlighted why this bill is needed and why it's hugely important, presenting officer. And they say the proposals in the bill to reform the complaint system seek to reduce complexity and prescription and to increase flexibility. This will help to drive efficiency and proportionality as far as possible within the current model. Uh, they also uh, say later in their, uh, in their briefing, we believe this bill will create a complaint system closer to the public the profession and the Parliament's expectations of an appropriate system for delivering consumer redress and administrative justice. Now, I welcome these comments and I hope that they are considered by colleagues from across the Chamber today. However, if someone needs to put a complaint to the SLCC, that indicates to me that, that there may have been a problem with the legal process beforehand. It's something that uh, Mr Swinney touched upon earlier uh, and also Michelle Thompson. Uh, so it's right to consider the overarching question of legal regulation in the whole system. And I know from my constituents that there's a great deal of frustration and anger with the Law Society of Scotland because of the events that I have articulated earlier. And the question of industry regulation certainly hasn't convinced many people, irrespective of what happens in this bill. And I know that there will be considerable interest and also proposed changes and amendments uh, to the bill, certainly at stage two. However, I do welcome the comments from the Law Society of Scotland when they described the bill as, and I quote, an important opportunity to introduce major and long overdue regulatory changes in the public interest for the benefit of consumers and those working within the sector. Now, the Minister is aware that I have called for an inquiry into the events that what happened at McClure Solicitors. Now, I don't believe an inquiry now would be of any assistance at all, but in fact would only delay and hinder people getting the legal paperwork amended. Now, with the two public meetings I've hosted and with the discussions I've had with constituents and lawyers, there's a unanimous view of my position. Now, the reason why a future inquiry will be important is clear. Whatever legislation we hopefully pass during this bill's process, I'm, I'm under absolutely no illusion that an independent inquiry will no doubt make suggestions for further regulatory changes. And I would hope that we can all agree across the Chamber that we want the legal profession and the complaints process to be at the highest quality and that consumer protection is at its heart. And the bill in front of us makes progress in that journey. But I am under no illusion that it will not be the end of the journey. But I will be supporting the bill at stage one uh, and certainly look forward to going through the parliamentary process. Thank you. Thank you, Ms McMillan. And I now call Jeremy Balfour, who will be the last speaker in the open debate. Mr Balfour. <coughs> uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. And can I say how pleased I am to speak in this debate? Uh, several decades ago, I was a member of the Law Society of Scotland. And in fact, my late father uh, was the fiscal to the disciplinary tribunal uh, for many years. So uh, it is interesting to hear the different comments already in the chamber. I also want to thank all the different organisations who have given submissions over the last number of days. Uh, I want to focus my brief remarks um, as a member of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee and I'm grateful for the evidence that the Minister gave to us, um, along with others who gave written and oral evidence. I think there is no doubt that we all agree there needs to be change uh, within what is happening at the moment. It is not quite sure whether the change that we are making is actually going to make things any uh, better. I think one of the criticisms, and this is not to the Minister because it was before she was um, in position, was that perhaps there was a lack of consultation with some of the key stakeholders before the bill was fully published and brought before Parliament. And certainly the evidence that we took as a committee was that perhaps some of the pitfalls that we are facing now um, could have been avoided if the government had engaged 
more constructively uh, with uh, the Law Society, with the Faculty of Advocates and with the Judiciary. But we have ended up in an interesting place that we do now have senior judges, we have advocates, we have lawyers, and we actually have consumer groups, all of them critical of this bill. Um, it's interesting that Esther Robinson, in her evidence uh, to the Delegated Powers Committee, well, it felt very let down that the government hadn't listened to what her work had been done, and she felt it was a missed opportunity. In regard to the more controversial areas, the Minister will be aware that many of these are within the delegated powers that will obviously come after if this bill um, is passed. I'm grateful that the uh, Minister wrote on three occasions to the lead committee, um, at least acknowledging that there were problems and that she and the government were going to address them. But we still haven't seen what those amendments will be and we do not know the detail of how they will work. Um, I'm interested in, can I also welcome Karen Adamson to her new role, I'm interested in her uh, comment that the League Committee may take evidence on some of the amendments before we decide to vote on them. My concern is that the Delegated Powers Committee won't have that opportunity to take evidence on the amendments that the Minister is bringing forward. And perhaps she could give some thought to, along with those um, who are above my pay grade, or whether the Delegated Powers Committee should have an opportunity to take evidence on the amendments once they have been laid, so that some of the concerns that the whole committee held could be addressed before the League Committee yet goes to vote on them. I do think it is important, and I hear what Mr Swinney and others have said in regard to the judiciary, but I think it is very important that the Lord Pre President and the whole judiciary is independent. And yes, we have to work together. I absolutely accept what Mr Swinney has said and others have said. But it is really important that whatever we do here today is that we do not we future-proof it, not for this government, but for future governments, that no government can overreach into the judiciary. Yes, uh, briefly, Mr Sweeney. I'm grateful, Presiding Officer, and grateful to Mr Balfour for giving way. Um, I, I, I very much associate myself with how Mr Balfour is putting forward this particular point, that we, we must maintain the independence of the legal profession, but there also must be a strengthening of the consumer interest. And that's the objective that I think Mr Balfour and I are perhaps sharing in this point in the debate. Jeremy Balfour? Um, absolutely. And I, I think we actually, for once, do agree, uh, Mr Sweeney, on this. My slight concern is is that we're not doing either, that we may be reaching in and taking power away from the judiciary and at the same time not strengthening the consumer rights behind that. And that's why I think we need to see what amendments come forward from the government at stage two. And that's why I do think, and I appreciate it does not happen often, that the dele delegated powers should take further evidence once the amendments are laid. Um, I would have preferred this bill to have, uh, for the government to have stopped, to go away and brought forward a bill that would have got far more support, not only in this chamber, but from the people outside. Uh, that is not the case. If it is passed today, I do hope scrutiny by both the lead committee and by other committees will continue so that we can get this right for every consumer in Scotland. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Balfour. Uh, and before we move to closing speeches, I would advise members that we have, in fact, used up all the time in hand, and therefore I would uh, ask those closing to please keep to their uh, agreed uh, allocated speaking time and any intervention should therefore be absorbed. And with that, I call Paul O'Keefe for up to five uh, minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I do think this afternoon has been uh, a, a constructive debate, actually, in terms of um, the interaction with members, in terms of interventions. I think that has been helpful. I want to reflect in concluding, I think, on three points, which are why, why we are where we are, uh, how we got here, and where we are going to go next. I think we've heard quite eloquently from a number of members today about the importance of access to uh, justice, access to a complaint system that works, access um, to uh, a, a robust system when someone has 
uh, been wronged essentially at the hands of a, a solicitor or a lawyer. And I think we heard certainly um, very eloquently from John Swinney, fr from Stuart McMillan, in terms of uh, what is going on with McClure's, which I think is known to many of us, uh, and to many others, uh, Russell Finlay included, about the challenges that people face when they are in the situation um, where it has taken a huge impact on their life, that they have been given bad advice, that they have been given wrong advice, and that they feel that they have no recourse uh, within the process, or that the process is too slow, uh, or does not act um, to hear all of their, uh, what, what they have to say and, and what they have to feel. And indeed, I thought Michelle Thompson's uh, explanation of some of that and her own experience, I think, was helpful. And actually, in committee, I was keen that the contribution that Michelle Thompson had made uh, in parliamentary questions was recorded within the report, because I do think it is important that we capture that as well. Um, I think many members reflected on how we have ended up here with this current bill. I thought Lee MacArthur's uh, outlining of um, you know, the Minister has inherited this bill in many ways uh, and that it has come out of um, a, a degree of uh, different processes of trying to consult upon the principle of reform that has never really managed to get to the point where there has been uh, a wider consensus. And indeed, uh, I think many of those concerns were raised around um, how do we ensure that we balance the need for um, a, a, an independent judiciary with the need to have uh, better reform of um, the legal services uh, uh, sector. And I thought Katie Clark's contribution laid out some of the thinking, certainly on this side of the chamber, in terms of how we might be able to uh, try and look at the bill we have before us, um, acknowledge that as I say, how we got here, but also uh, find a way through in amending the bill to try and make it better. Um, again, I think across the chamber, we heard a number of um, views about what... Certainly, I'll give way to John Swinney. Uh, John Swinney. I'm grateful to Mr Kane for giving way, presenting officer. I, I welcome very much the comment that Mr Kane has just made there about the notwithstanding how people vote at five o'clock, but there is a willingness to engage, because I think the debate this afternoon as he has acknowledged, has helpfully aired where I think members of Parliament wish to get to. Nobody wants to undermine the independence of the judiciary and the legal system, but we need to strengthen the position of the consumer interest. And I look forward to engaging with Mr O'Kane on that point. Paul O'Kane. Uh, Mr Swinney has very helpfully, uh, given that we don't have much time in hand, has moved me, I think, to my final point, which is where do we go next and how do we create that consensus that I think we all want to see. For me and for this side of the Chamber, it is about those amendments in terms of the ministerial powers, ensuring that we see detail of those amendments, ensuring that we have time as a committee to scrutinise those, ensuring that we as a Chamber can scrutinise those. But I think it's also about looking at all of the other aspects that have been raised in this debate, where there might be further amendment um, uh, to support the many good contributions from organisations like Citizens Advice, like Women's Aid, those who have a view in that space, and also, of course, the Law Society has other amendments they would wish to see as well. So, whilst today we will abstain on the general principles of the bill, it is with that view to trying to make the bill better at stage two, so that it is in a position by stage three where we can all support it. And I, I think that I would be really keen to hear an undertaking from the government in that regard uh, when they come to their summation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kane. I now call on Megan Gallagher uh, to, to close on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives. Up to six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Every party in this chamber believes that we need to reform our legal services. Access to these services must be simplified, but for this bill to be good law, we need to ensure that all stakeholders are on board with the proposed changes. Rape Crisis Scotland has condemned the current legal complaint system, as has members in the Chamber today. And just to provide reassurance, there are no disagreements on this position. As a serving member of the Equalities, Human Rights and Civil Justice Committee, I feel like we have been through the mill with this bill. During the scrutiny process, we had an unprecedented intervention from two of the most senior legal figures in Scotland. Then there was the backlash from those in the legal profession who are still concerned about the Scottish Government's handling of the bill, especially in relation to the additional powers that could, as the bill stands today, be given to Scottish Government ministers which could threaten the independence of our legal sector. The bill and its... Yes? John Sweeney. I'm grateful to Megan Gallagher for giving way. Um, I want to just take her back in her speech to a comment she made a little while ago, which was that we need to get to a position where everybody agrees on this. 
And I just wonder if she would accept, and this is in a sense a hypothetical question, that sometimes it's difficult to get all stakeholders to agree on something. So does she see that as a necessity that everybody has got to agree about everything? Or do we need to apply some of the judgments that Mr Finlay, for example, or Mr Balfour have put on the record today about the importance of ensuring that we address the consumer interest while taking account of legitimate issues that are at stake, but, which we, but upon which we might not get universal agreement? Megan Gallagher. The bill had so much potential to bring everybody together. But what we heard, and certainly what I heard from the evidence sessions, is that it hasn't brought everybody together. Everyone seems to have something wrong with the bill, and that's why I've made the points that I've made today, because this was an opportunity, and in my view, unfortunately, it is a huge missed opportunity for this Scottish Government. Um, if I could make some more progress, because I know time is tight. Um, the bill in its current draft repeatedly seeks to draw the Lord President into the administrative uh, collaboration with Scottish members. And the fact that this was drafted in the bill to begin with shows that somewhere, someone misunderstands the concept of the separation of powers and the respective roles and spheres of the executive and the judiciary. We heard from Esther Roberton, who founded the review upon this the bill was structured only to be told that her central recommendations of the introduction of a single regulator had not been included in the bill. So the questions that I still have is, well, what was the point of the review and what was all of that hard work for? Because Esther Roberton was essential into the reform of legal services in Scotland. And then, of course, the committee was informed that the Scottish Government would be bringing amendments in at stage two. But the committee hasn't seen those amendments and we don't yet have an exact timescale. And as far as I'm aware, unless the, the Minister um, can update us today, the Lord President has not seen those amendments in full Either. So we are kind of in the dark here in terms of what the bill will look like moving forward and we won't know more until we hit stage two. And again, it has been said many times today that the Minister has inherited the bill, but this bill has not united consumers or the legal profession. It has managed to disappoint both sides and this was raised by Jeremy Balfour during his contribution. And I don't buy the, the argument, Minister, that it would be inappropriate for amendments to be shared. I think exceptions could be made and it could have provided that reassurance to those who are scrutinising the bill and those who the bill will directly impact. But I think it is fair to say that this bill has created division instead of trying to bring all stakeholders together to create good, solid legislation. The Minister, in her opening speech, outlined that she uh, moves that this Parliament accepts the principles of the bill at stage one. But the question I have for the Minister is this. How can she ask the Parliament to support a bill when we don't know how far the bill is going to be amended and whether the amendments will address all of the issues raised by the stakeholders during our evidence sessions? I raised this time and time again during the committee sessions. I asked, for, uh, I asked questions about having to re-scrutinise this bill, about going over previous homework because the government hasn't managed to get its act together when bringing the bill forward at stage one. And if I can take this opportunity to, to congratulate Karen Adam again on her appointment as convener. But I must say, I'm less than enthused that we're having to revisit some of these scrutiny evidence sessions again, because as Jeremy Balfour pointed out, the Delegated uh, Powers Committee doesn't look as though it will be afforded the same opportunities that we will be within the Equalities Committee. And I don't think that makes for good overall scrutiny. Um, so I'm not prepared to vote for a bill that is stands as open to political abuse. Ms Gallagher must begin to conclude. A apologies, I'm beginning to conclude. Um, presiding officer, there's a, a lot that I would like to say, but I, again, you know, time is, time mm. is moving on. Um, but the complaint system, if I may finish on this point, it is costly, it is complex, it's outdated and it needs to be simplified. But it doesn't mean that we need to vote for a bill on a whim on the hope that the Scottish Government gets its act together and gets it right at stage two, because that will not help consumers who need uh, a simplified process and a protection when making a complaint, and it won't bring the legal sector on board to make sure that this legislation works and works well. Thank you. Thank you. And I call on the Minister to wind up up to seven minutes, please. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to draw this debate to a close by thanking all the members for their views today. And of course, I will consider carefully everything that has been said today in this debate. I would also once again like to thank the committee who have considered the bill and all of those who provided and gave evidence at stage one for their careful consideration and views. And I think it's fair to say today that there has been a wide ranging debate and the different views and opinions amongst members have been very well expressed. Esther Roberton said in her report, I believe that professional bodies providing both regulatory and representative functions can lead to the perception that the two roles are in conflict. It is this perception that risks compromising public trust. Legal regulators view that there is no genuinely true conflict of interest, nor any risk to the per perception of one once they properly understand the regulatory process. However, Perception has a powerful influence over opinion, and the approach outlined in this bill will do much to deliver the priorities of maintaining the independence of the legal profession and strengthening the regulatory duty to work in the public interest. And I want to ensure that this bill strikes the right balance between the various interests. It is to everyone's benefit if greater trust can be developed in the integrity of regulatory framework for those providing legal services. And this bill seeks to address concerns from consumer groups that legal regulation does not offer sufficient accountability in protecting the public and consumer interests by improving the transparency and accountability of legal service regulations in Scotland. If I may, presiding offer, uh, officer, I've got a few things to go through just in reflections of today's um, debate so far. I know that a few members have commented on and to reflect on how we've got here today. And I know many members, there's a history here of nearly 10 years and many of the members um, were not here for the whole in, entirety of that time and are quite new to the, to the parliament. So I think it's a, important just to give a bit of context and history to where we currently are. Back in 2015, there were calls for reform from stakeholders and indeed the Law Society of Scotland set out reform proposals as did the Scottish Legal Complaints Commission. And the Scottish Government then established an independent review to develop views on potential reforms by the independent panel by S Esther Roberton. Now the Fit for Future report for the uh, report of the Independent Review for Legal Services Regulation in Scotland was published in October 2018 and the Roberton report made 40 recommendations with a primary recommendation that there should be an independent single regulator for all providers of the legal services in Scotland. And in 2019, the Scottish Government response to the report that was published in June and the analysis of the Roberton report established that while there were many recommendations that were widely supported, the primary recommendation of an independent regulator had very polarised views from the legal and the consumer landscape. And as a result, the Scottish Government made a commitment to issue a public consultation based on the recommendations made by the Roberton Report with the intention of seeking to build consensus on the way forward for this much needed reform. And at the time, the Scottish Government worked collaboratively with stakeholders from the legal and consumer perspective to design the consultation. And in seeking to build agreement around the proposals for reform, the consultation contained two alternative viable models of regulation, in addition to the Roberton Report primary recommendation. Now, the, the anal analysis of the consultation showed that views were evenly split between the support and opposition of the independent regulator. However, many of the areas there was broad agreement. The analysis highlighted that all respondents, regardless of affiliation, shared a common aspiration that the need for any future model to be transparent, open to public scrutiny, and efficient to ensure that justice remains accessible to all. This bill will allow a proportionate approach that seeks to balance and deliver the key priorities of the stakeholders and the much needed reform. Now, I, I appreciate um, Jeremy Balfour's comments about the engagement prior um, to the bill being published. And I just want to assure the member that I'm very keen to engage moving forward with all members and stakeholders. And I do take up um, the comment and happy to look into the, the uh, possibility of the DPLR committee being involved in an evidence session when the stage two amendments come forward. If I may also, if I may just, if I've got time, I've got a lot to get through if I may and I'll come back to you. Regarding complexity of the Scottish legal um, claims, 
complaints system. I think it's important that we highlight the, what the Scottish Legal Complaints Commission have said in the briefing that they sent to all members. This bill is very welcome and a significant step forward in a number of areas. Now we want to see it delivered and implemented to realise those benefits for the consumers and for lawyers alike. If I could go to Katie Clark's um, comments regarding the sections just for the ministerial powers being removed. It was section 5, 8, 20, 29, 41, 35 and 49. And just in relation to section 19 and 20, in recognition of the comments from the senior judiciary, we do intend to lodge amendments which will transfer the powers um, in section 19 and 20 to the Lord President and continue to explore with the Office of the Lord President what further adjustments will be made. Um, Stuart McMillan, just in relation to the McClure solicitors, which I know is a topic that he's done a lot of work on, I'm aware of the issues of a number of families that are facing as a result of the McClure Limited going into administration. While I cannot comment on individual cases, the Scottish Government has taken a proactive steps to strengthen the legislation in respect of legal regulation, which will help to mitigate against such situations in the future. If a client is dissatisfied with the service or conduct of a Scottish solicitor, they have the right to complain through the Scottish Legal Complaints Commission. And if I may, Liam Kerr, just come back to a few points that you raised during the debate, uh, just regarding the Law Society saying that it would disappoint, I think it was uh, intervention to Karen Adams, regarding um, some, uh, some of the powers that they'd sought had been left out of the bill. I can, I can confirm that we will be introducing amendments at stage two, which will make many of the changes that the Law Society has been seeking, um, especially in the conduct complaint process, and we're working very closely with the Law Society on that. And also just examples that you asked about how sections 19 and 20 had been used previously. The current lack of transparency in relation to legal services regulation does make it difficult to predict at when the power may have been used previously. But it may, it may be helpful to reflect on Tracy Riley at Consumer Scotland's comments to the committee highlighting that if the powers were removed entirely, then primary legislation would be the only recourse if the system was not delivering the regulatory mm. objectives. Presiding officer, as, as for my part, I will continue to engage with stakeholders and members to address any concerns that are raised with me as we go through the parliamentary process. I am committed to working constructively with the committee and members ahead of stage two, and my door is always open to anyone who Minister would must like conclude. to discuss the bill. I know that some of the provisions in this bill have led to differing views, including within the committee, and it's this balance that the Parliament needs to consider if we are to <coughs> deliver the significant improvements to the regulation of legal services that are really needed. I believe if we all work Ministry, constructively must across the Chamber, we will end up with a bill that is appropriate, proportionate and effective at the end of the process. Therefore, I urge Parliament to agree the principles of the bill. Thank you, Presiding Officer.